Hey everyone, my name is uh, Joe Rosbeck. Thanks for, uh, I'd like to thank the uh, New Jersey Federation of Camera Clubs for having me uh, speak today. Um, I am a professional nature and landscape photographer. I've been doing this full time for um, just about 20 years now. Um, before that, I worked as a sports and um, photojournalist in the Washington DC, Baltimore metro area. I did that for about 10 years. Um, before I broke in and did, I uh, was able to make the, the leap into doing um, what I do now full time. Um, I, um, I lead several workshops every year, uh, publish images in calendars and magazines and, and books like that. I've co authored a couple books on photography. Um, one I did uh, in particular with uh, Ian Plant um, about 10 years ago. And then I did another one with um, six other photographers about 11 years ago. And that was um, myself, Ian, Richard Burnaby, Mark Adamus, Guy Tal, um, Jerry Greer, and uh, one other, uh, who else was in that? It doesn't matter. <laughs> so anyway, I've done a lot of publishing over the years and I've been leading workshops full time now for, I guess about 15 years. So anyway, um, I spend a, quite a bit of time in the field shooting. I, I tend to do about, 150 to 180 days a year um, out um, shooting um, in a variety of locations. Um, I now live in Virginia, uh, in the mid-Atlantic of the United States, just outside of Washington, DC. Um, before that, I was in California for five years, um, which was nice, but I couldn't really handle the taxes <laughs> and the cost of living out there. So I came back to Virginia, which is a real nice place to be. Um, so yeah, I'm going to share with you guys some of my favorite images this evening, and I'm going to talk specifically about composition and lighting, because for me, that is the sort of the, the two most important aspects of making really dramatic and thoughtful landscape images that um, emotionally connect with the viewers, having a really, really compelling composition with interesting lighting. So. You know, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and I'll jump into Keynote and we'll get started. And I just want to make sure, can everyone see that all right? Just let me know. I'll try to collapse my, let me collapse my box up here first before I start the presentation. Just kind of hide this down here in the corner. All right. So, um, Tonight we're going to talk about how to make better uh, photographs through the use of advanced composition and use of light. Uh, this is something that I, I love talking about and I'm often teaching when I'm leading workshops or doing online classes and webinars, which um, I do quite a few of those uh, nowadays um, with uh, since COVID hit. Um, but I am still leading workshops um, just in a more limited capacity until that passes over and things get a little bit better, hopefully sooner than later. Um, this is an image from um, Zion National Park in an area called the Narrows. The Narrows is an incredibly beautiful um, slot canyon that the Virgin River has cut through. Uh, the walls are anywhere from, you know, a thousand to 2000 feet high. It's an exciting hike and the light in there is absolutely incredible. Um, I like to visit in the fall and in the winter to do my photography in Zion because, well, in the fall, it's absolutely beautiful because you do have a mix of cottonwoods and maple trees in the canyon that change color in the fall and it's absolutely gorgeous. And then in the winter, you have the opportunity, hopefully to capture snow and ice in the canyons and the visitation is very, very low. Zion has become one of the, probably one of the most popular national parks in the United States. And it's very hard to shoot it in the spring and the summer simply because there are just so many people visiting the park. It has a shuttle system um, that you have to ride the majority of the year to get to any of the locations to shoot or hike. And um, so it just becomes very problematic at other times of the year, but being out there in the fall and the winter is a really nice time to shoot. Uh, for this particular image, um, I was in the water. Uh, you are in the water 
for the hike anyway. You're hiking through the river. Occasionally you can get up on little sandbars or rocks to hike through, but a lot of the time you're walking through the water. It's anywhere from ankle deep to waist deep uh, in the canyon. Uh, this was made in mid-November, so it was rather chilly. Uh, I think typically the temperatures hover in the 30s in the canyon in November and you're in the water. So you have to wear special equipment like uh, a dry suit for, for, you know, for example, with uh, canyoneer boots and neoprene socks and all that jazz to just basically stay warm enough to shoot for the day. Um, so this shot, I really loved the reflected light or the bounce light that was hitting that canyon wall and the reflected light that was happening in the river itself. Um, this light happens at this location um, only for about 20 minutes each day in November between 11 and 12 o'clock when the sun is in the right position and it's basically hitting the canyon wall that's just out of view in the composition on the left hand side and it's getting this really strong direct light on the wall. Of course I didn't include that into the composition because it, frankly it doesn't look that good and it's, it's just way too strong of a, a light source to include in the composition but it reflects all that beautiful light back down into the canyon. And I got in very, very close to the wall to include the reflected light and the striations on the wall with a wide angle lens that helps to create a really engaging uh, set of leading lines um, that brings the viewer deeper into the image. So let's talk about a few things that I think really make for, you know, uh, a, that help to develop a photographer to have their own vision and style. Uh, this is an image, by the way, of just three uh, cottonwood leaves in a pool of water and oil that I photographed in Southern Utah um, in canyons of the Escalante. Actually, this was taken down in a canyon called um, Calf Creek. And I was able to you know, do this shot when catch the um, the reflections off of the oil in the water uh, with these leaves in the image. That oil is very reflective. It's a natural oil. It comes from decaying plant matter um, and it will collect on the surface of uh, bodies of uh, pools of water essentially. Um, it's the same thing as if you saw like an oil slick in a parking lot from a car. It looks very similar to that and it's just extremely reflective. So what's happening in this image is I'm positioning the camera and waiting for the right time for that canyon wall that's above to be illuminated with strong um, early morning light to reflect down onto the oil. And the areas that are coming out with that really um, bold blue color is the sky that is reflecting from above. So moving the camera around just a few inches left to right, I'm picking up very different patterns in the reflections. So passion, passion is for me, I think one of the most important things to have to become a successful photographer. If you do not remain passionate about the craft of photography, about getting out and experiencing the, uh, the beauty of the landscape and trying new things, then you are going to be treading water at some point in your development as a photographer. So. Um, things that help to keep me remaining passionate are trying new techniques. Um, and sometimes that comes with new technology um, and really visiting and exploring new locations. Um, and when I say that, I don't necessarily mean going to different places, but visiting different places inside of locations that I may have been to many times. This is an image from Death Valley National Park in the Mojave Desert of California. And I had been shooting in Death Valley for a long time until I one day decided to park my truck and just walk out across this open dry lake playa that's very featureless. And I walked for about a mile and a half and I was just, and I, I'll do this very often when I'm shooting is I, I, I try to work in a lot of time for scouting and exploration. You never know what you're gonna find. Um, and I was able to walk out about a mile and a half and find these really amazing mud tiles out in the middle of the desert. 
Um, and then I've returned to this location many times over the years to, um, to try to you know, capture it under different uh, atmospheric conditions and different lighting conditions and come up with different types of composition. Um, this is a very low angle, wide angle shot. Uh, my, my camera lens is only about four inches off the surface of the mud um, to kind of get this really unique perspective and to also uh, make the mud tiles look much, much larger than they are in real life. They're actually pretty large mud tiles there, but getting low and going wide um, is one of the things that I'll do often with my, my bigger grand landscapes to exaggerate and create a really engaging foreground in the image. Now, when I also spoke about working with new techniques, uh, this is a new technique that I've been using for a few years called focus stacking. Um, you know, an image like this would not have been uh, possible for me to get in years past simply because getting that low and close to the subject, I would not have the depth of field um, capabilities to render the image uh, sharply in focus from foreground to background. But with the new technology of using focus stacking and how easy it is these days to do that, uh, both in camera and in post-processing, it's something that I've added to my quote unquote bag of tricks um, for making these really, really extreme wide angle landscape images. Joy, and like I said, oh yes, Joe, go ahead. Joe, I have a couple questions if, if, mm -hmm. if this is a good time. Yeah, yeah, sure. For sure. the Zion, for the Zion um, pictures, they want to know whether you, you were escorted on your hike or and whether you were wearing waders. I was wearing a dry suit, which comes all the way up to basically, I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's a canyoneering suit that canyoneers wear. Um, you can rent them in Springdale, which is the, the town that is just outside of Zion National Park. Um, and, and so you really need something like that. You could wear chest waders um, to go up the narrows. It's just uh, the dry suit is, is a little warmer in my opinion, and it's a little bit more comfortable than chest waders. So you can get the whole setup to do the narrows hike um, at one of the outfitters in town. And it'll come with the dry suit, um, canyoneering boots, neoprene socks, um, stuff like that. So they'll get you all set up to do the hike up there. If you go there in the summer, it's, it's warm enough that you could hike the canyon with river sandals and you know shorts. But um, in the fall and the winter and even I wouldn't recommend necessarily doing it in the spring because the water levels are usually too high from all the snow melt uh, from up above, but um, it gets pretty cold. So you'll need something like that um, at other times of the year. And I, I just wouldn't go there in the summer because I mean, I've hiked that canyon in the summer and there literally are like hundreds, if not thousands of people walking up that canyon in the summer. So it's very difficult to, uh, to make good photographs under those conditions. And then the other questions are um, the mm -hmm. lens you were using for the mud flats. What size was it? Yep. So this was made at 14 millimeters, and this was made with my Nikon 14 to 24 2.8. So um, yeah. So real quickly, I primarily shoot most of the stuff that you're going to see in this presentation, and most of the stuff that you see on my website are made with primarily three lenses: um, an ultra wide angle lens. That's my Nikon 14 to 24. Um, a mid-range zoom that's and I use a 24 to 70 2.8 and then a 70 to 200 f4 and then I also have a 300 millimeter f4 that I'll keep in my bag um, for doing longer lens uh, landscapes like much more intimate stuff or you know vignettes of things that are further away um, yeah, and I would say that probably 90% of my images are made with either the ultra wide angle or the 70 to 200. So. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> well, I spoke a little bit more about exploration, but exploration is really just so important for me, especially nowadays, because there's just so many people taking nature and landscape photographs. I mean, if we just go to Instagram and look around for a few minutes, um, you're going to see thousands of images of the landscape. So, and a lot of those people tend to gravitate towards the, you know, the same locations, iconic locations. So I'm always trying to find new places to shoot. And there are so many 
places to photograph that have not been done before or have not been done by many people before. It's just a matter of putting the time in to find them and sometimes the effort to get to them. This shot in particular is a really good example of that. Um, this beautiful horseshoe bend in the canyon, this is in Marble Canyon in Arizona. And it's, it's more popular, Big Brother lives right up the street and his name is Horseshoe Bend. You know, the, you know, the original Horseshoe Bend that you see um, literally millions of photographs of that's right outside of Page, Arizona, which is quite easy to get to. It's right off the side of the highway, you park, you walk about three quarters of a mile to the edge of the canyon and there you go. Um, but it's, you know, very difficult to make original photographs there nowadays because it's been photographed literally, you know, millions of times at this point, probably. So I like to study um, satellite imagery. In fact, I'm kind of a map nerd. Um, you can ask my girlfriend, like most nights I'm laying in bed, like looking at like satellite imagery on my iPad before I go to bed. And I'm just trying to identify locations where I might want to, you know, strike out and see if I can find some good photographs. And this is one of them. I had noticed that uh, further down uh, Marble Canyon, there are quite a few of these big bends in the Colorado River. And I was like, all right, what can I do to get out to these locations? Um, this is actually taken from the Navajo uh, Reservation in Arizona. And it requires about 50 miles of loose sand off-road driving to get out to this spot. Um, but when you get out to it, you'll be the only person there and you'll get photographs that not many other folks have images of. In fact, this place is so incredible. I was able to actually park my truck literally five feet from the edge of a 2000 foot drop and, and camp there overnight and, and shoot these images. So um, I'm always trying to find new spots. I just was out in the desert two weeks ago and um, I try to schedule in between assignments and workshops um, at least a few weeks each year to, for just exploration where I'll go by myself or with a buddy um, and we just look for new places to shoot. And we found a bunch of new places um, this winter. Uh, got a couple good images of those spots uh, in a few of those locations. The lighting um, and the atmosphere didn't really work out, but I'll be back and I'll get those images at some point. And then obviously composition. So just this shot once again. I, composition is so absolutely important. I really feel like it is the one thing um, that allows a photographer to, to define his or her personal style through shooting is the way that they see the world and the way that they arrange those abstract and graphic elements in a composition to make an image. So what I can say about that is Composition is something that you should always be learning more about. You should always be striving to get better at composition. I know that I'm always striving to make better compositions and to make different compositions and to mix up my style. And so that's always something that I'm very, very focused on when I'm shooting. And then of course, with nature and landscape photography, light is of absolute paramount importance as well. Um, unlike studio photographers, um, we, you know, we can't make our own light. We have to work with what mother nature gives us. Um, so choosing a location in the right light or coming back to a location time and time again, until you get that right light is really, you know, what this game is all about. Uh, this is an image from, um, a place in, uh, southern Utah, just outside of Moab. And it's not in a national park, although it's very close to Canyonlands National Park. In fact, um, it's only the turnoff for this is only about five miles from the entrance to Island in the Sky. And on the left hand side, you can't see it, it's out of frame, is Dead Horse Point State Park. Um, so, once again, I'm always looking for like these sort of like new and unique locations. Um, to capture the landscape. And once again, I found this just by looking at satellite imagery and noticing um, a really beautiful um, overlook that looked like a good overlook. And I found that there were some, some dirt tracks that went out to it. And I just decided to drive out there and see what I could find. Um, and so I've been back to this spot many times. 
on this particular evening, I got some of the best light I've ever had out here. And this was actually taken almost um, 20 minutes, almost 20, 25 minutes after sunset. Um, in fact, sunset was sort of a bust. There was no good light at sunset, but there was a really heavy um, uh, sort of like uh, winter cloud cover in the sky. But there was a gap on the western horizon and the western sky started to absolutely glow on fire um, about 15 minutes after sunset and it just intensified. So all the light that you're seeing in this image is simply bouncing down onto the landscape from that gigantic cloud um, off to the right on the western horizon that's just putting all that light down onto the landscape. Um, so that's another sort of important lesson when you're doing um, this sort of work is, is, is you got to show up early and you got to stay late. Um, it would have been, you know, it was a long day. Honestly, I was very tired at that point. I have a long, I had a long drive back to the hotel I was staying in that evening. And, um, you know, at sunset, it didn't look good. It would have been very easy for me to just like pack up the bag and let's get an early dinner and get out of here. Um, but I decided to wait around in hopes that something might happen and it did. So you, you put in the time and that's when you're going to get the good images. Joe, another question. When you're yep. going to some of these places like your your off the trail horseshoe bend and and the and this last one, do you yep. need a pass to get into them or a reservation? Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. So this shot is made on BLM land, Bureau of Land Management. And so there's no, you don't need any permits to go out there, um, anything like that. You don't need a pass. I mean, it's just go go as you go as you please. Um, the photograph that I made of the Horseshoe Bend from the Navajo Reservation required a, a, back, a backcountry permit from um, the Navajo Parks and Recreation Office, which was easy to get. I mean, you can go into uh, Cameron or into Page and pick one up for about 10 bucks. <laughs> um, and if there's any restrictions, they'll let you know. Traveling on Navajo land right now is completely restricted because of COVID. That shot was made a few years ago. Um, so it really depends. You got to, most of the shots that I'm doing out West that are sort of off the beaten path are not in the national parks. They're on BLM land and BLM land is completely open to uh, hiking and exploration without um, permits. So it's not a big deal. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So preparing for success, research, scouting, having your equipment in working order, taking the time spending the time and remaining inspired. So what I mean by that is I do a lot of research leading up to a photo trip, a lot of research. Uh, not only do I study what other photographers are doing, but I, I, I'm pouring over guidebooks, I'm pouring over maps. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about it for weeks or months in advance before I ever even get to the location. So when I get there, I have, um, I have ideas. I have a lot of ideas and a lot of notes on places that I wanna shoot. And then I scout them. If it's a new location, I always scout before I shoot. Um, I want to see what it's like. I, I need to get into a rhythm with the location. I need to walk around with my camera, not rushed because the light is changing, and look for where those engaging compositions are. Study my apps when I'm at the location to see where, what angle the sun is rising and setting from. So where's where's the light going to be hitting the landscape? You know, if I have a big sky, is it going to catch light in this direction or that direction? So it's important to be out there. So I always try to get out to a spot, you know, at least a few hours in advance or at least a day in advance and, and really just spend time uh, hiking around, exploring around, driving around and scouting around and coming up with um, mental sketches of photographs that I can make. And then when the light and the atmosphere and everything else comes together, I have much better idea of where I want to be and where I need to be to make those photographs. Um, equipment, you got to keep your equipment in good working order. So I try to get my stuff serviced. Um, usually before each trip, just get the sensor clean, make sure it's in good working order, especially if it's a big trip. If I'm going to shoot locally, I'm not going to worry about that. But if I'm going out to the desert for two or three weeks, or I'm taking a trip to Iceland or Patagonia or wherever, I'm going to make sure that everything's in great working order before I get out there. Um, then I said, like I said, taking the time, spending the time, putting the time in to make the photographs, not rushing through and just snapping a shot in one location and moving on to the next. I will literally spend a lot of time in a spot until I feel like I got the light and the composition right. But at the same time, you also have to be willing to um, 
to throw in the towel. Because <laughs> sometimes it's just not coming together. You're not inspired by a location or the lighting isn't good and it's just simply time to move on and try something else. So you have to be flexible as well. You know, that being said, like I talk a lot about like pre-visualization and scouting and research, but it's also really important as being a creative person and a photographer in particular is to stay open to whatever the possibilities are um, that you encounter when you're out shooting. So you, I, a lot of times I'll go into a situation with um, an idea of a shot that I want to make, but if, you know, the light and the weather aren't working in my favor, I need to stay open to whatever else is happening out there. Um, and then, you know, remaining inspired. One of the best ways to remain, in, to, re, to remain inspired for me is once I said, like I said before, to explore new locations and to get the proper rest that I need. So take care of your body and listen to your body when you're out shooting. And if you're tired, take a nap. Um, if you feel like uh, you need to sleep in one morning because it's going to refuel you, you got to do that. You know, you got you to gotta stay healthy when you're out there shooting. Um, otherwise, it's very easy to, um, to not want to do it anymore. So here's a shot from um, Skyrock, which is an ancient um, art panel site in um, Owens Valley of California. They think that this, this, the, the rock art here is at least 2,000 years old, um, maybe older. Um, this was a very difficult location to find. I'd seen photographs of it. There aren't many out there. And simply that's because no one talks about the location. You cannot find this location in any guidebook that I'm aware of. And if you go into even the ranger station, they won't tell you where it is. Um, it's simply because they're afraid people are going to vandalize it. Um, I found it um, by scouring the internet and looking at photographs and checking the metadata of photos. And I found a gal who had taken, she was just not a photographer, she's just a hiker and she took a snapshot of it and she had her GPS <laughs> tag turned on. And I probably looked through 150 to 200 images on the internet until I was able to find the GPS points for it based off that image. Um, <clears throat> and so then once I identified where it was, I was able to hike up to it and I've shot it many, many times. It's a beautiful location because you get the Eastern Sierra mountains in the background that's mount tom right in the very back the big one um and then over to the left of the palisades um and you get this beautiful beautiful indian rock art work right in the foreground i've done many shots there a lot of times i'll camp overnight and do night photography this is a shot i did at night i brought the camera up set it up um very long exposure and used a artificial light to, um, to, to bounce some light back onto the rock. It's a volcanic rock. So the rock is almost like this dark gray to black um, with, the, with, the, with the rock art sort of scratched into it. Um, you can walk over it. You're not gonna really harm it. It's not painted on, it's scratched into the rock. And um, so, yeah, I needed a light source to, to bring uh, the detail out. Um, so, but I like doing this kind of stuff. I, I, I really do when I'm by myself, if I'm not running a workshop, I prefer camping a lot of times. I like to camp on location and um, I, it allows me to like shoot at all times of the day, whether that's early morning, late evening, or if I get so inspired and the conditions look right, maybe even in the middle of the night. So let's you, talk a little bit about, oh, go ahead, sorry. No, do you, um, I think you might've answered this, but I just wanted to clarify, do you, do you, when you're in the canyons, do you use mixed lighting or, um, other lights, types of fill lighting, such as fixed flash or reflections? No, I, I, I don't ever use any flash during, with, I mean, with my landscape stuff. May, sometimes I'll add um, a mixed lighting source in for night photography, for light painting, for example. Um, but when I'm working like, you know, during the day or in the canyons, I'm working with all natural light. So a lot of times when I'm working in canyons, I'm looking for reflected light, okay? So I wanna be in the canyons on the kind of days where photographers don't wanna be out shooting. And those are those crystal clear blue sky days because inside of the canyons, that's when you get that really strong reflected and bounce light in the canyons. Um, so what I'll do is if I have a day where there's really big clouds, 
um, and I can do the big landscape stuff, I won't go into the canyons. I'll be up on the rim of the canyons and I'll be shooting those kind of vistas, excuse me. But on days where it's crystal clear, which honestly in the desert, it's more, it's more than not, um, I'll be inside of the canyons just working that reflected light. And you usually get the best light. It depends on the, you know, the, the nature of the canyon, how deep it is, if it's a slot canyon or whatever. But the best lights typically between about 9 a.m. and 3 o'clock in the afternoon is when you get that really, really strong reflected light in the canyons. That's my favorite time to be in them. And are you usually, are you usually by yourself on these trips or are you with others? It depends. I, I do a lot of solo photography. Um, some of the shots that you've seen, I've actually been with workshops. So the first shot in the slideshow with uh, Zion Canyon is actually leading a workshop when I took that image. And I'm, you didn't see it in the shot, but there are five other people that were lined up right next to me and I was instructing while we were shooting that. So um, sometimes I, I don't usually like to shoot. If I'm not running a workshop, I, I prefer to shoot um, alone. <laughs> Uh, I just like being alone with my thoughts and sometimes I'll go out with a, a buddy, uh, maybe one other person. I'm not big into doing big, you know, groups of friends and stuff. I just feel like I, I like to do my photography sort of as a solo thing uh, when I'm out shooting. And that's just something that I've been doing for a long time. You know, when I, when I was breaking into to trying to build a portfolio and I was still working um, as a, you know, a freelance photographer doing sports and all that stuff, I would take off during the summer and just, you know, load my truck up and be gone for two months by myself the entire time, just doing photography, uh, camping by myself, hiking by myself, shooting by myself. And I kind of got into that. I really enjoyed it. So I, I still do really, really enjoy that. Um, just being out there by myself. If it's a dangerous location, like a really long off-road drive, um, or a really difficult hike. A lot of times I'll try to buddy up with someone just for safety and numbers sort of thing. But if it's just shooting in a national park or, you know, some place that's not you know, overly worri worrisome in that respect, then I, I do like doing it by myself. I like working with other people too, but I feel like I do my best work when I'm alone. All right, thank you. Sure. Uh, compositional techniques. Go wide for that dramatic near to far effect. With a wide angle lens, if you're getting down low and going wide and choosing the right foreground, you can create stunning sweeping landscapes. Now it's important to choose the right foreground. You can't just get low on any old thing and expect to get a great wide angle landscape out of it, okay? So, in, you know, for example, this is a shot from the Vermilion Cliffs in Arizona and I'm getting down very, very low with my 14 millimeter to um, use the striations of the sandstone as a lead in sweep to bring the eye deeper into the composition. So I'm always trying to create some sort of visual movement or visual flow in my images where I'm taking the viewer right from the beginning of the shot and I'm moving the eye deeper into the frame. Now for this particular shot, what really makes the image for me is that pool of water that's reflecting those clouds above. It breaks up the middle of the composition. It gives it a little bit more interest and a little bit more depth. Um, so then, yeah, I'm down real low shooting this stuff. So get in low and go wide, but use those lines and those shapes. Always try to think when you're composing an image in the abstract, okay? So that's a difficult thing to do. And that takes a lot of study and a lot of practice to think about what those compositional techniques are, whether you're using vanishing perspective or um, a zigzag effect or, you know, a shape-based composition or a leading line composition. Leading line compositions are, are probably the easiest ones to do, right? Find a nice line that leads into the shot. Okay, that's not that difficult. Um, but if you can get your lines to move around through the shot, then it becomes very, very um, effective compositionally. And then try to balance the frame out as well. So, you know, uh, one of the things I talk about a lot in my, you know, online classes and in workshops is working with like visual counterpoint. So if you have something really dominant in the frame, try to find something that, you know, on somewhere else in the frame that provides counterpoint and balance and weight to those things so that the composition doesn't get too heavily weighted down. Uh, use bold shapes. 
So these very triangular shapes here are really what makes the photo. Um, and, you know, this is not, this was, I didn't think anything was going to happen compositionally on this evening. This is out in Death Valley. And once again, I'm just wandering around on these like sort of these playas, these dry lake beds, uh, looking for something interesting. Okay, so I have a really, you know, um, sort of stormy sky. Uh, that's kind of cool. I like that. I like the, the sort of blue hour look to the image. But I didn't think I was going to find a shot because you can see if you look outside of where those triangular shapes are into the frame, it's just kind of mud flats out there, right? It's nothing really interesting to point the camera towards. Um, I could have gotten low on some of those water channels and used that. But as soon as I saw these um, salt formations, I felt like, wow, that, now that is a really engaging and interesting and energetic um, set of shapes that I can use in the foreground. Um, so I chose that for the composition. So try to think in the abstract and use those shapes um, to make much more powerful compositions. Once again, here's another example of using powerful shapes. And these are once again, sort of triangular shapes uh, for this series of cascades that I photographed in central Pennsylvania. Now, this is happening not only because of the way the water is flowing over the rock, but my choice of shutter speed and the way that it created some texture in the water allowed those sort of really strong triangular shapes to form. Too long of an exposure, and I lose that sort of bold graphic shape up front, okay? Um, so this is me using the shutter speed and, 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 and the motion of the water to create that abstract shape. And that's something that, you know, you're not going to see with your eye, obviously, right? That comes with um, experimentation and with uh, just some knowledge, like knowing that rushing water can take on different shapes if you experiment with different shutter speeds um, to create that. So I had to kind of mess around with the... Um, the shutter speed and ISO combination to get it just right uh, to record the water like that. So it took a little bit of time, but it was absolutely worth it. And this was taken in Ricketts Glen State Park, by the way, for you folks that are in the New Jersey, New York, Mid-Atlantic area. It's a really great place to shoot. Lots, I'm sure many of you know about it probably, um, but if you don't, you check it out. Lots of great waterfalls in there and lots of good hiking. Really nice in the spring and the fall. There's a question here related to if you get down low and wide, do you pro do you have a problem with depth of field when you're down low like that? You can, and that's what I was speaking about earlier with using focus bracketing, focus stacking to bring the image in focus all the way through. So for an image like this, I'm not as worried about it, right? Because the foreground is moving water. So it's not gonna be tack sharp, sharp like a rock would be or mud would be or something like that, right? So I'm putting my focus back on the rocks and then shooting that at about F11 and I have enough depth of field to cover the image. If I had been down low like I was um, on those mud tiles in Death Valley, that image consists of about four images that are focus stacked for depth of field at, F, uh, at, at F11, okay? So when I'm down low like that, yeah, you do have to worry about your near to far focus. Um, it's gotten a lot easier though. I, I shoot with the Nikon 850 and the, uh, the um, it has a focus stacking feature, which is automatic. So I just basically in live view, uh, manually dial in my focus right up front. And then I just hit <laughs> the uh, stack focus uh, menu and it just goes through and takes as many shots as it feels like it needs to at the given aperture that I have it set for. And then I just put them together in Photoshop. Um, very easy. You can also use... Um, Helicon focus to uh, to achieve a focus stack as well. So Helicon's nice too, actually, because you can actually stack all the images and it gives you a DNG file that you can actually import back into Lightroom and process it um, like you would a raw file. DNG is a raw file, essentially. Um, when you do it through Photoshop, you actually have to make your adjustments on your raw images and then apply them to however many images are in the focus stack, whether it's two or 10 or whatever, um, before you put it together in Photoshop. Because once Photoshop puts it together, you're then gonna have either a TIFF or a PSD file. So you're not gonna be able to, to make those raw adjustments to the image after you've put the focus stack together, so. 
With respect to the desert pictures, do you use haze removal tools in post-processing for those? Yeah, occasionally I'll use a little bit of dehaze to, to pull back on the desert, you know? Although I do most of my shooting in the desert in the winter these days. Um, and honestly, if you, if you do go out there in the winter to shoot, um, you don't have as much haze that you have to worry about at other times of the year. It's much, the, the, uh, the atmosphere is much more clean and clear in, in the winter. So it's not as problematic then. Um, and then sometimes I like the haze in an image. It adds that really interesting sort of like atmosphere to the shot. So I won't in some situations correct for that. I'll keep it if I, if I think it's working well with the, the light and the composition. Did you use an ND filter and what was your shutter speed for the waterfall? For this particular shot? Right. Yeah, I did not use an ND filter. I used the circ circular polarizer. I believe the shutter speed, I don't have it right here, but I'm, I think it was around between one quarter and one eighth of a second. It wasn't terribly long shutter speed because like I said before, the longer shutter speed was, was blurring the water up front so much that I was losing that triangular shape that was formed by the, the way that the one wave kind of comes across from the um, from the right to the left and intersects with the, uh, the the shape of the rock. So going too long, and I, I, I lost that. So um, it was just a polarizer, and the polarizer is used just to remove glare from the wet rocks and the leaves to 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 improve the contrast and the saturation in the image. All right. Thank you. Sure. Um, S curves are gonna, so an S curve is a leading line, but it's an elegant leading line, right? Because it's, instead of just moving in a straight line, it's meandering through the image. Um, so it's, you have much more energy to the shot and a lot more depth to the image. So if you can find a beautiful S curve leading line, uh, that's gonna work out really, really well for you. Uh, this is just a simple, small stream. I mean, this stream is extremely small. Uh, that I found inside of this Aspen Grove in Colorado. I mean, I can literally step across that stream without jumping. It's only about two feet wide, but it's just has this perfect flow that runs through the image. I had found this shot um, years ago in this, uh, this, this grove of Aspen. Um, and then I waited and came back until a lot of the leaves had fallen onto the ground. So when I first was shooting it, the ground was pretty bare. And as you can see, there's a lot of just like, there's not a lot of grass around this stream here. It's a lot of like sort of muddy banks and it didn't look that attractive to me. But once all the leaves had started to fall, then they you know added that beautiful touch of texture and color uh, to the ground. So those little tiny details are super important. Um, and like I said, like I'll come back to locations um, time and time again until I feel like I get it just right. And then here's another example of an S-curve. This is once again formed with, um, with water and, and, and leaves, leaves in the water and a long exposure. So this was uh, about a 30 second exposure. And what I did, honestly, guys, is I threw those leaves in the stream to create that. I could see the way the water was flowing. There were like these little um, little bubbles on the surface of the water. And I could see the way that they would come down from the, the base of the waterfall and, and wind their way around this rock. And I did a bunch of shots like that. And there's some like little white lines coming through. And I thought, okay, that's interesting. Um, so I went ahead and climbed back up the hill and found a, you know, just a big bunch of like, leaves that had fallen. I stuffed them in the outside pocket of my camera bag, brought it back down to the scene, set up the shot, threw the leaves in the water under the pool, or threw the leaves in the pool of water under the waterfall. And as they started to move out, I ran that long exposure to create that um, implied S-curve that really didn't exist until I put something into the mix and sort of made it happen. You can sometimes craft a composition around a source of light or a point of light. Um, this is something that I do oftentimes when I'm working in slot canyons. Um, I'll try to time it where the light is coming through cracks in the wall and I'll create this sort of symmetry. 
Um, and then if anyone ever tells you that you shouldn't center your compositions, you can laugh at them <laughs> because that is absolutely not true. Um, a centered composition can work out extremely, extremely well if it's done right. And so this essentially is a centered composition. So we have a, a line of light that's in the center of the frame, and then the source of light is also pretty much right in the center of the frame. But because those two rock walls are um, creating so much symmetry between the two of them, it, it brings the eye into the shot and it ties it together really, really nicely. So what I'm trying to say with that is there are no rules of composition, okay? There are guidelines and suggestions and they are meant to be broken. The more times you break the rules, the better photographer you will be in the end. So, you know, use those rules as a starting point and then throw them out at some point. Always lead the eye. Compositionally, always lead the eye and lead the eye in the right direction. So if you're gonna use really powerful shapes and lines in your compositions, they need to move into the frame where they, where they need to go, okay? So for example, uh, the subject matter here are these, um, these, these desert buttes in the background, right? And I'm getting in low and close to this sandstone. And then as the light's coming up and it's striking it, it's creating this you know, really wonderful um, leading line pattern but it has to bring the eye into the frame right where those buttes are. I want the eye to go straight to that, okay? If, if the line leads off out of the frame and away from the subject matter, I've done myself a disservice because the eye is gonna, the viewer's eye is immediately gonna exit the scene and it's not gonna stay engaged in the photograph any longer. So if you're gonna use leading eyes or leading lines to lead the eye, make sure that they lead to the right location in the image. And so that may just be a matter of moving around um, and finding the right perspective to shoot from. Uh, one, of, one of the Ansel Adams famous sayings was, uh, sometimes the difference between a good image and a great image is just a couple feet. And it's true. Moving around just a few feet or up and down just a little bit to find the best composition um, can change the image completely. Uh, look for convergence in your, uh, especially when you're shooting um, telephoto shots. So this is an extreme telephoto shot of sand dunes in New Mexico. And, you know, obviously I was drawn to the shape of the dunes and the texture of the dunes and the light on the dunes. Um, so instead of going wide, this is shot with a 300 millimeter to stack that perspective, that convergence of lines. I'm not gonna get that same convergence with a wide angle lens, right? Because my foreground is gonna become so big and everything in the mid ground and the background is gonna fade out putting on a telephoto lens allows me to really create these graphic abstract representations of the landscape. Um, and so that's what I'm doing right here. I'm just standing on top of a dune and I'm picking out the best convergence of line and light with a long lens. Um, so I love shooting long lens compositions. Like I said before, most of my shots seem to be taken either with the ultra wide angle or more of a telephoto lens. And that's kind of what I'm drawn to. Uh, create, look for vanishing points. Vanishing points add a lot of mystery and a lot of depth to your images. So this, in this image, the vanishing point is the light in the background and the shape of the canyon. Now this is one of the most narrow slot canyons I have ever explored. The walls are so, and I'm not a huge guy. Uh, those walls are so thin that there are parts of that canyon that you are scraping your chest and your back when you're going through that canyon. So if you suffer from any form of claustrophobia, it's not a place that you want to be in. Uh, even getting the tripod set up in this camera or in this canyon is, is, is problematic at best. When I'm standing here and taking this shot, the canyon floor that I'm standing on is only about six inches wide. Okay. Um, so just getting the legs set up was hard. And then when I frame the image, the sides of the wall are literally, and I'm not kidding, inches from the front of the lens. So this was an image that had to be focus stacked. This took almost 12 shots to get that near to far focus where all those little um, uh, part, all those little pieces of the canyon that are right up in the front of the frame are just as sharp as the background is. And then I waited for that sort of glowed light, that glowing light to, to come into the canyon to, to, to create that vanishing point, to pull the eye deep into the back of the frame.
A few more questions, Joe, if that's yep. okay. Go for it. Um, on the creative side, do you use ICM sometimes? Intentional camera movement? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I love using ICM. I do a lot of um, uh, like, like pan blurs and multiple exposure stuff where I'm moving the camera around. So yeah, I don't limit myself at all to any sort of a technique. It's all open for me. So yeah, there are sometimes when I'm doing traditional landscape stuff, no, I'm not using that. But if I'm doing more abstract or intimate stuff, um, especially with like shooting in woodlands, forests, uh, gardens, and things like that, I love using ICM. Do you have any interest in moving to mirrorless cameras? Um, not right now. Um, not, I don't have a, a problem with mirrorless cameras. I'm just, I'm so happy with my 850 that I'm, I don't feel the need to, to, to change it at this point. Um, I, I may do that at some point, you know, um, I might. Uh, the problem is I'm gonna have to reinvest in all kinds of new lenses for it, for the Nikon anyway, because the mount's different. Um, or I guess I can get an adapter for it, but yeah, I'm kind of, I'm a pretty simple guy when it comes to equipment. I like what I have and I like what, what works for me and I'm more interested in the creative aspects behind it. Plus I'm still young enough. I'm only in my mid forties. I can still carry the weight around and if, you know, it feels okay to me. Um, I think if I get to a point where it becomes problematic in that respect, that I would think about moving into maybe a mirrorless system or something a little bit lighter. What aperture and what time of day was that picture with the waterfall and the leaves and the S-curve? That was shot on an overcast day in sort of like the middle of the day. It was probably sometime around two or three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and that was in October. That's in West Virginia, by the way, um, in the highlands of West Virginia near Canaan Valley. Um, what was the other part of the question? I'm sorry. Um, what was the time of day and the aperture? I uh, believe that was shot at F16. Let me wow. take a look. Yeah, that was shot at F16, um, ISO 100, and that was a 30 second exposure with a circular polarizing filter. And that was taken on a very, very overcast day. So the, the, there wasn't much light down at that waterfall on that day. So it was easy to get that long exposure. Are you altering your color palette in post processing? Ooh. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I tend to do uh, not, not significantly, not significantly. Um, I set, first of all, I don't ever use auto white balance. I, I, I have a lot of custom white balances that I set up um, and, I, and I'll use them based on the lighting that I'm getting. Um, and then I will alter that slightly in post through either a color grading or painting with color sort of technique. And what I'll do for stuff like that is I'll take a color that's already existing in the image and I'll add to it. Um, it's sort of a complicated, it's a hard thing to explain. You'd have to take one of my processing webinars, but I use, um, I use luminosity masks. So I'll make a selection based on color and luminance values. And then I'll make a selection of that color and change the hue of it to either being a brighter tone of that color or a darker tone of that color and um, then I'll paint in with it. So it's sort of like dodging and burning, but where you're adding a little bit of color as you dodge and burn, as you brighten and darken through the image. Most of my processing is what I would call selective adjustments. I don't do a lot of global adjustments on my images. So if you were to look at some of my files, like in Lightroom, you'll notice that like in the basic tab and the tone curve tab and HSL, you're not seeing much that's happening there. I do most of my stuff through radial filters and brushes um, selectively where I bring them into Photoshop and I use luminosity masks to do extensive dodging and burning, lightening and darkening to move the eye through the shot. And so that's something I learned because um, when I started in photography, I was a film photographer and I shot large format and I actually had a black and white darkroom for many years, um, studied the works of like Ansel Adams and Minor White and all those guys, and I read all of Adam's books and as many books as I could, and I on on black and white um, photography and, and and darkroom work. So I was doing an extensive amount of uh, dodging and burning in the wet darkroom, and I took a lot of that uh, workflow into the into my digital workflow through Photoshop. And last question: Was the color enhanced in this picture, the vanishing point? No. 
No, this, the, the color inside of these slot canyons is insanity when you get this bounce light. Um, you have to be there at the right time of the day to get it though, because if the light is not bouncing or reflecting into the canyon, it's rather dull inside of that canyon. So this was made actually with a daylight white balance. And what's happening here is that really, really strong light. And you can't see it because it's just out of the frame. But right above that, at the top of the wall, is hard middle of the day, noon, direct sunlight hitting that canyon wall. And it's bouncing and reflecting off of the walls. Remember, these walls are very narrow. They're about you know anywhere from six inches to 24 inches apart. So the light bounces through there uh, like a prism. And so the areas that are, are there, that are getting that strong reflected light are a much warmer tone of red. I mean, these walls are naturally, this is, this is um, Entrada sandstone that this canyon is cut through. So these walls are naturally have sort of a reddish salmon tone to them to begin with. Um, so once they get that light on them, they turn to fire. It's amazing to see it happen. And then as soon as the light gets out of there, it becomes very dull inside the canyon again. So this, this light lasts in this canyon in the summer for about two hours each day. And that's between about 10 a.m. and 1230, typically. And then it's gone. Once the sun arcs out of the way, it's not coming in the canyon any longer. OK, thank you. Uh, use, use bold shapes, obviously, guys. So this is, this is once again out on a playa in Death Valley. These shapes are very different than the ones that we saw earlier with those triangular shapes. These are circular shapes. So these are much, much more of the, the feminine, um, you know, and they are just give the image a very different sort of aesthetic and a different sort of a feel. But I'm always searching for these really, really beautiful shapes to incorporate into my landscape images. Once again, long lenses for uh, stacking elements. This is a photograph that I made of um, uh, the side of Lone Pine Peak in the Eastern Sierra of California. This was made with a, what did I shoot this with? A 400 millimeter lens. And this is during um, a windstorm in the mountains. So all that atmosphere that you're seeing back there is what we call spin drift. So that's just snow blowing off the, the summit of the mountain and I waited till the end of the day when the sun was low on the horizon in the western sky and it was backlighting the scene. And it really, so once it backlights like that and the sun is, the sun source is behind me, it's creating that amazing glow in the spin drift that's lifting off. And I shot dozens of images that evening because the, you know, the way that the snow blows off the peaks and swirls around, it's constantly changing. And this one I just happened to like the, um, the shapes that it formed the best. And here's another long lens working with compression. This is the moonrise over this Aspen Grove in Colorado. This was made, and this is one of the few images that I've made um, sort of like after sunrise and sunset of a broad landscape, but I needed it for this shot because that's when the moon was rising. So I had planned this out. I found this really beautiful, um, layered uh, forest mountain ridge shot. And I used an app called um, Photo Pills to, to know exactly what time of the day that moon would be rising above that ridge. And so I just made sure I was in position for that to catch it. Uh, look for the beautiful patterns in nature. Go intimate with your shots. This is a shot of cottonwood leaves and reflections in a pool of water in Zion National Park. So sometimes, you know, I love to just explore these very quiet scenes. And I love the sort of slow photography uh, thing where I'm not rushing around trying to catch the big landscape or catch the big light, but I'm in the canyons or wherever I may be. And I'm just working this really soft, quiet sort of light. Um, that's my favorite kind of photography. It's almost in a very meditative state that I get in when I'm shooting these kinds of, uh, these kinds of scenes, I love it. And, and these, these sell really well. Prints of this will sell better than a grand landscape, to be honest with you, because more people tend to connect with these, these smaller scenes than they do the bigger scenes sometimes. Use motion to create the lines in the composition, right? So this is a, 
an abstract that I'm using just shape and, 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 and color for, okay? So there's nothing that's really sharp in this image because I've, I've zoomed in so far with the telephoto lens on this little, you know, cascade of water that's dropping in this stream that's catching this reflected light. And then I'm playing around with long exposures um, and, and different shutter speed combinations to create some sort of abstraction of just color and shape. And that's something, and once again, that's sort of getting into that sort of slow photo movement, that sort of quiet meditative state where I'll sit and play with something like this for an hour or two. And I just get into a zone and um, it's really, really, really cathartic. And it's a fun thing to do for me. Um, paying attention to the, the smaller details in the landscape, you know, once again, just a few examples. You saw the one shot earlier. There's the full frame of the three cottonwoods and the reflections with the oil. The one next to it is of um, the world famous wave in Arizona. Although I tried to photograph the wave from a different perspective. So instead of doing the standard wave shot, I've gone into a, just a small section of the wave and I've gotten in with a ultra wide angle lens close to the walls to sort of distort uh, the perspective of the lines. Um, having that little bit of snow sitting on the ridge lines right there adds a nice little touch. I photographed this in the winter um, and then these ice formations, uh, I love photographing ice. I mean, ice is fascinating to me. Um, it always looks a little bit different. It's got such incredible texture. And it, it just really forms these incredible um, details that you don't really see in many other things in the natural world, the way that ice comes across. So, you know, this is just a really thin sheet of ice. I mean, it's probably centimeters thick. Um, and I photographed this just on a small stream in Western Maryland. So a lot of times in the winter around here when we don't really have great snow events, but it's cold, I'll, I'll go sort of what I call creaking and I'll just walk along the edges of creeks and ponds or whatever. And I'm looking for just, you know, cool ice formations. And then I'll do like sort of these really cool macro shots of them, spend some time with them. Here's another shot. Uh, this was an image, this is a good illustration of like kind of dropping what you think you want to shoot and shooting what's actually happening. So this was made in Grand Teton National Park or actually was made just outside of Grand Teton National Park in the National Forest. I, I was in a location where I had scouted where I could photograph this Aspen stand against the Tetons in the background. So I went up there to do this sort of um, grand landscape, but the clouds that I had all day suddenly disappeared about an hour before sunset. And there just wasn't, the, the grand landscape shot was not happening any longer. So I could either do one of two things. I could continue to try to shoot that and make a really unsuccessful landscape image, or I could change my entire way of thinking in that moment and look for the beauty of what is actually happening around me. And that was just photographing uh, single aspen leaves against these sort of um, highlighted uh, dappled light backgrounds, okay, and just using an extreme bokeh techniques to create that, um, that, that light in the background. So instead of shooting that leaf at like f11 or f16, so it's all sharp, I'm shooting at f2.8, I'm just focusing on a very small portion of the leaf and, and, and using that technique to create that sort of extreme bokeh blur. And that's an important thing when you're doing this type of photography or if you're doing macro photography or anything like that is to pay very close attention, really even more so than your subject matter to what's happening in your background, okay? Because if your background becomes overly distracting or chaotic, it's, you're probably not gonna make a successful image. I kind of like these to be a little bit more on the uh, simple side for these sort of shots and just really focus on a single interesting subject matter with great light um, coming through and some sort of really pleasing soft background. Try capturing things from an entirely different perspective. So in the last couple of years, I've gotten into doing drone photography. I think it's absolutely amazing to see the landscape from above. Um, this is an area in um, southern Utah called the Blue Hills which is this absolutely alien Martian landscape. Um, and it looks insane from a couple hundred feet above the surface. 
So I've been spending a lot of time out there um, just flying my drone and looking for these aerial abstractions. Um, I'll have a lot more of that to share if you guys follow my work because it's just a continuing project that I'm working on. Um, I actually was hoping to photograph some of this stuff on my last trip out there a couple weeks ago, but lo and behold, uh, they're, they were all covered in snow. So you couldn't, you couldn't see the patterns in the landscape, which was a little bit unfortunate, but that's okay. Um, so yeah, and here's another example of shooting these, these, these Martian badlands from above. Absolutely amazing, right? So when you're standing on the ground, this, these bentonite hills, they look interesting, but when you fly above them and you look down on the insane patterns and insane color in these, uh, in these, these badlands out here in Utah, it's, it's just incredible. Um, it's funny actually, because there is a place with the, about five miles from where I shot this called the Mars Desert Research Station. And it's where um, they tested a lot of the rovers and devices that they used on the, um, the mission uh, to, to Mars or whatever. So, um, because the, the landscape out there is absolutely so Martian. There's no vegetation that grows out there. It's, it's, it's an incredible place to, to shoot. So just, you know, broaden your horizons, use new technology and new things to, you know, broaden your horizons and, and take great images. A few more right. questions, Joe. Yes. Okay, uh, several several pictures ago, there was the picture of the uh, blue tones on the sand sand dunes, and then shortly thereafter, an image of Death Valley. And this individual wants you to talk a little bit about the light in in those photos. Let me go back and just refresh my. Is it, is this the one? Uh, yeah, I think so. That, yeah, I think that right. was it. One of them, and then the one two. I think it's two before this one. Like that. Yep. That one, yeah. Yeah. So this is really easy to make, guys. All right. And so what one of the things I'm always thinking about um, when I'm working in color is the color wheel. OK, so I'm looking for a juxtaposition a lot of times in the shift between warm and cool tones. And you can achieve this a lot of different ways. One of the best ways to achieve this is to not shoot in auto white balance and to shoot in daylight white balance. So a situation like this, what's all that's happening here? And the way that the light is coming out like this is because I'm shooting on a crystal clear blue sky day, right? Early in the morning. So the light on daylight white balance, when the light is hitting the dunes, where the light is actually striking the surface of the, the dunes, it's, it's, it's warm. But the areas of the dunes that are in deep shadow are reflecting the light above, and that is the blue sky. So the Kelvin temperature is going to render that as a blue tone. And then you can accentuate that sort of mix of warm and cool when you get it into post, okay? Just by creatively sliding your white balance around and either going a little bit towards the blue spectrum or a little bit towards the warmer spectrum to bring that out. Same thing is happening in this particular shot here, okay? <clears throat> so this is, a, this is, a, this is actually a, like a twilight shot almost because the sun has set and had, had been set for a while. So, you know, it's taken almost during that blue hour. Now there's some color in the sky because the clouds in the west are starting to underlight a little bit, but all that blue light is reflecting down onto the landscape, okay? And so what's happening in a situation like this and why it really works for this kind of stuff and why it really worked for those sand dune shots, first of all, those are in white sands, New Mexico. So the sand is white to begin with. So that stuff pretty much is gonna reflect whatever color is in the sky. And you may have seen shots from, from, from white sands where they look pink, the sand looks pink and it's, it's because there's a big, beautiful pink sky above and it's reflecting um, that light that's in the sky. And what's happening here is I'm shooting out on this playa and all of the stuff that looks really blue is white salt formations, okay? So that white salt is like that sand dune and it's once again, it's reflecting that light that's in the sky and it's mostly a blue light. You can see that if you look at the edges of those circles, there's a little bit of like that reddish magenta in there. And that's some of the light from that, um, that, that really colorful cloud that's reflecting back into it. But most of it is blue. And if you look at the areas that are not the, the salt formations, 
they're not as blue because they're not white. Those salt formations are extremely white because it's just salt that's building out on the desert out there. So that's how I'm achieving that a lot of times is strictly playing with my white balance in camera to, to create those warm, cool combinations. If you used auto white balance and adjusted in post-processing to daylight white balance, would, would you get the same result? Yeah, because if, you, if you're shooting a raw file, you will, yeah. If you're shooting a JPEG or something, then no, you're not going to be able to achieve that. A raw file, yes. Now, here's my argument against doing it that way. And it's always been my argument. I like to see what's happening when I'm shooting because I can't change my composition after the fact. So if I see a play of juxtaposition of color happening, I may compose the image differently to help accentuate that. Um, I'm not going to be able to fix that later. I can't fix the composition later. Once I've shot it, that's it, right? So, you know, if I'm seeing the way that blue is reflecting off of the salt formations, I may include more salt formations in the foreground to, to pick that up. Same thing with the dunes back here. If I'm seeing the way that the blues and the, the, the yellow warms, the orangey warms are playing together, I'm going to try to compose the image a little bit differently to, to play on that. Um, so I think it's important to sort of like, to see that when you're shooting, right? Uh, it is for me anyway. Can you talk a little bit more about the bokeh blur in that leaf picture that you had? Yes, yeah, so that was a really easy one to shoot. So what's happening here is uh, I'm shooting this with a 200 millimeter lens and a 20 millimeter extension tube, okay? So the reason I'm using an extension tube is just to get a little bit of a closer focus with that telephoto lens. It's, that's not a macro lens that I'm shooting with, so it only will focus in so far. The extension tube just allows me to get in a little bit closer and obtain that more of a macro style focus. Now, when you're shooting with an extension tube, you're going to automatically start to get a, a very sort of um, uh, blurred background, okay? So a lot of times what I'll do is, and I like to do this with a lot of like my abstract flower photography and stuff, is use a long lens like a anywhere between 100 and 300 millimeters with some extension tubes and shoot where the light source is, I'm shooting into the light source, okay? So what's happening is the sun is setting out here behind me and it's, it's basically what's, what, what you're seeing in the background there, guys, is um, a body of water. So you see how it has that sort of bluish tone to it? There's a, little, there's a little pond back there and the light is glimmering off of that pond and so I'm just positioning the camera in such a way that, and I can see it happening as I'm shooting because as I'm looking through the lens, I'm seeing that bokeh with the lens wide open and with that extension tube on. And I'm just trying to position the camera angle to include that into the frame. If you look over into the top left portion of the frame, it's darker, right? Cause that is actually part of the forest that's coming through in that section. So it doesn't have that same sort of bokeh glow to it. So a lot of times when I'm doing these bokeh shots, I like to shoot towards my light source. It just helps to accentuate and bring a greater feel to that, that, that out of focus area. Another question is how hard is it to get a sharp image when you're using a drone from above like those photos that you showed? Easy. <laughs> easy? It's easy because you, you don't even have to focus. The, you don't even focus the thing. Um, you know, this shot was taken from about 120 meters off the surface of the ground. So it's basically an infinity focus, right? So that's a, the drone is a fixed F4 and I never even, you know, I don't even have to worry about stopping down. The, the, only, the only hard part about getting the drone image sharply focused is dealing with any sort of wind that's happening in your shutter speed, right? So if, and I've run some shutter speeds on my drone where I've done four second exposures with the drone in flight and gotten sharp images, believe it or not. But if the wind's blowing and the thing's popping around, then you need a faster shutter speed. But if you're in a calm, if it's a calm, you know, if there's no wind, you know, you're, you're good to go. I'll shoot just, you know, I've shot stuff down to one second, half a second, totally sharp. So it's really easy because the drone's so, it's like shooting infinity focus. I mean, you're basically at infinity. You're so far off the ground that you don't need the depth of field any longer. All right, last question is, what is your opinion of cropping? Nothing wrong with it, but I try not to do it simply because I don't like throwing away resolution. 
Um, Cause I, I do a lot of printing. I sell a lot of prints um, and I like to be able to print my images big. So if I do any sort of excessive cropping, it's obviously I'm not going to be able to print those images as large as I would like to. So I try to, um, I try to get that composition just right when I'm shooting, if I can. Now there are situations where I might have to crop a little bit, right? Um, maybe I can't walk any further because there's a cliff there or I don't know, whatever. Like I, I have a great composition, but there's a, you know, um, distracting tree right on the edge and I can't seem to frame it out for whatever reason. I'll crop it out, but I don't tend to crop my images very much. I'd say like the, the max crop that I do on, I've done, I do on most of my images, maybe you know, five to 10% crop. Cause I, like, like I said, I simply don't want to throw away too much resolution because I want to be able to print the image big. And then also because I do a lot of uh, image licensing, you know, sometimes I've done sales for like, you know, billboards and stuff. And if I crop too far in, then the resolution may not be there anymore for the sale. So I try to get it right as if I can when I'm shooting, but um, nothing wrong with it. I don't see that there's any problem with cropping. I don't think you should use it as a crutch though. I mean, for, for not coming up with the best composition, like try to really dial in and, and nail the composition when you're shooting. That way you don't have to do excessive amounts of cropping in, um, in post. Do you have any preference on the drones that you use? Well, I use the, the Mavic drones, the DJ drones. Um, and the one that I'm using now is the, the DJ, um, the Mavic Air Pro 2. And I really like that one because it, first of all, it's got a, it's got a, it's got a 48 megapixel sensor in it, right? So I can actually make pretty big prints off of it. Um, and it's super small. Like it literally is smaller than my 70 to 200 millimeter lens. So like it never leaves my camera bag. Um, and it has a great flight time. I can fly on a single battery up to 35 minutes. So I've gotten into the situation, I've gotten into, you know, some situations where like, I'll literally launch the drone and find a composition and just let it hover as I'm shooting images with my normal camera from below. And as the light gets good, I just have, I'm just watching the screen of my drone. And as the light gets good up there, I just adjust the exposure and click a couple shots off. <laughs> it's really awesome. All right, thank you very much. Welcome. Um, so I, let me see, am I running out of time? Yeah, it's 3.30, so I'll, I'll speed up a little bit. Um, we'll just talk a little bit more about lighting, capturing light. Uh, a lot of times I like to shoot right into the sun, very dramatic, bracket your exposure so you have something to work with uh, because the dynamic range can get very tricky, okay? Use side light if you're looking to create texture and depth in an image because that is going to give you the light and shadow. So this image of uh, this, this mountain range in California, when the sun is coming on its head on and it's fully bathed in light, it looks very flat. Catching it from the sun coming up at an angle, 45 degree angle, creates those layers of light and shadow and gives a much more three-dimensional look to the image. Same thing here with these dunes in Death Valley. The light coming from the side is creating this play of shadow and light, and it's giving the image great amounts of depth. If those dunes are all evenly lit, it's very flat, okay? So waiting for the sun to be low on the horizon is when you want to be shooting this kind of stuff, okay? So this is like the golden hour, right? 30 minutes before sunset, 15 minutes before sunset for this particular shot. Sun's coming out of the west. It's sculpting that slip face of the dune. It's bringing out all the ripples in the dune. You won't see that if the sun is, you know, 20 degrees higher in the sky. It looks very flat. I like using spotlighting, okay? So that's like what we would call dappled light, for example. So if there's cloud cover in the sky and the sun is just hitting a few areas of the landscape, creates greater amounts of depth in the image. Here's another example of using spotlight. It's one of my favorite shots of these winter cottonwood trees um, in the Owens Valley. And you know, it's a nice shot in soft light, but just waiting for that little kiss of light to um, hit the middle ground of the scene and the image, it's like, it's like turning the lights on, right? The image comes to life at that point. Like I said, shoot into the sun. It can be very tricky, but it's very rewarding. Um, this, here's a classic sort of like Aspen shot, right? Down, lay, laying on the ground, wide angle lens, shooting up into the canopy with the sun coming through. So I'm shooting right into the sun, middle of the day shot. Um, 
but it works out really well. So here's a trick for sun stars, guys, because a lot of people have trouble with them. Stop your lens down to about f16 and partially obscure the sun. Okay, so you don't want the sun directly out in the frame. It's going to look too big. You're going to get a lot of lens flare. Look for something to partially obscure the sun coming through, like a tree trunk, for example. That's what all I'm doing here. And because I'm shooting this in the middle of the day, I did this handheld at f16. I had about one five hundredth of a second for my shutter speed because it was extremely bright. And that allowed me to lay on my back and just move the camera around just a little bit until I found the right position and um, for the sun star where I didn't see too much glare and it had a really nice poignant look to it. And then boom, snap, take the image. That simple. Here's another sun star shooting through these curvy aspens in Colorado. So that's my point of light in the background. And, you know, I'm just making, basically exposing. Um, so I'm opening up my shadows. I'm letting some of those highlights blow out in the background. I don't care if the sun blows out. It's the sun, it's supposed to look bright. It's the brightest thing in the galaxy, right? So we're good. Um, we don't need to have detail there. And you, by the way, you're never gonna recover the detail for your sun star shots. Your colors are gonna start to look very weird <laughs> to say the least. So. Let it blow out, let it go white, expose for your, your mid-tones and your shadows so you don't have an underexposed image and it looks muddy and dark. You wanna see the detail in those forest images when you shoot stuff like this. And then just wait for the best light, be extremely patient. I was out shooting these channels in Death Valley and the light was boring, gray, and once again, just hanging on location and waiting and hoping and praying and then boom, it just started to light up. This lasted for maybe two minutes, this light, and then it was gone. It was just like one of those quick burns after sunset and then it faded right back out. But I was in the right place at the right time to get it using these channels of uh, water as a reflecting lines leading into the image. Another shot from the Narrows in Zion. And this is, I've set up on this shot because I love the composition. And then I waited about an hour um, just, you know, sat on a rock, had some something to eat, had a cup of coffee. I bring coffee with me when I hike up there because it's cold in the fall and waited for that right light to bounce into that section of the canyon. I could see that it was coming. I could watch the light on the top of the canyon walls moving and the way that it was bouncing down into the canyon. I knew the way the sun was arcing in the sky. So I knew that that light would eventually move in and I would get that beautiful glow in the background. Shoot at twilight. Twilight allows you to work extremely long exposures for creative effect. This is a shot of a single Joshua tree with some sandstone in the background. And that's the moon back there that's providing that source of light. It's mostly behind these thick clouds. And this is like a two minute exposure, okay? It looks dark to the eye when I'm shooting this, you know, it, but during the course of that exposure, I was able to get the detail out of the image and then also get those clouds moving through the frame over the course of that long exposure. And you can even see, if you look closely, there are a couple little dots of stars up in the sky that are beginning to form. And this was the same tree the next morning. So I stayed there overnight. This is in the Whitney Pockets wilderness of Nevada. And um, there was this huge lightning storm that came in around four or five o'clock in the morning. And I got out of my tent and I set up a composition and I went back into the tent, to the safety of the tent, and I used a lightning trigger um, that would just trigger the camera each time a, a bolt went off. And on this particular one, I happened to catch a couple bolts at once, and they were the best ones. And so that was an awesome morning. A little scary, but pretty, pretty cool. <laughs> Work the bounce light, especially if you're working in canyons. It's amazing. This shot is just made from reflected light and nothing else. Once again, daylight white balance, I get the blue on the areas of the water where they're in shade and I get the warm red rocks where the light is actually bouncing down into them. It's another example of this slot canyon on the Navajo reservation of working that bounce light. You see the way that glow light comes through, absolutely stunning. Look for the warm cool mix, something that we've spoken about. So once again, what I'm doing here is looking for that warm cool mix. This is actually a film photograph that I scanned four by five images I shot about probably 15 or 16 years ago. And using Fujichrome Velvia without using a warming filter to correct for, 
allows the sides of the canyon walls that are in shade to have those blue tones and the sides that are getting the bounce light to have those warm tones. Bad weather, great light. I mean, if there's a storm coming in or moving out, that's when I wanna be on location shooting. That's when you're gonna get those really insanely dramatic skies. It's a shot of a brain rocket, white pocket, as a gigantic monsoon afternoon storm is moving in. I always go to the desert, usually once uh, every summer to try to chase the monsoon storms around. Once again, bad light. This was a storm that hit Colorado in the fall. Didn't see those peaks for about two days. And then as that storm started to lift and they started to come out, look at the drama in a shot like that. I'm waiting for that right light. There's a little bit of light hitting the mid landscape from the sun that's breaking out in the western part of the sky. Shoot the golden hour for your landscape stuff. That's when you're going to have those really, really intense shadows and warm colors in your images. Another golden hour shot of Mount Snuffles in the San Juans of Colorado. Work the edge of light. This is one of my most famous images. This image was, uh, this image hangs in the Smithsonian Natural History Museum in DC. And uh, this is a shot I made of the second wave in Arizona. And I, this took a lot of planning to do this. First, it's a long hike to get into it. It's a six mile hike, you gotta go in the winter because you don't get any light on this at the end of the day, any other time of the year, because to the west, there's a huge ridge of cliffs, but there's a notch in those cliffs. And in January and early February, the sun sets in that notch and you get that last rake of light across this sandstone. Absolutely incredible location. Uh, wait for the edge of light for sand dunes. That makes the difference with sand dunes, the low angled light. I don't really like shooting my sand dunes when there's not light on them because you don't get that three dimensional definition and contrast. But waiting for the light to be either low on the horizon at sunrise or sunset is key to those types of images. Shoot the moon. Yeah, I love doing these astro shots. The shot through Mobius Arch with Lone Pine Peak at, um, at moonset at twilight. Um, so longer exposure. I'm not worried at this point about getting detail on the moon. I'm using the moon as a point of uh, source of light in the sky. So this is about a 15 second exposure at um, F11 or F4. No, I'm sorry, this is F14. And so you get almost like a little bit of a sun star out of the moon. It's another moon shot from the Alabama Hills. Um, I used an external flash for this one though. We spoke about that. Somebody asked about that earlier. So the moon is behind this arch and I'm exposing for that in the sky. And once again, I'm using a small aperture, a long exposure to create that, that beautiful sort of light in the sky. And then I used a flash with a sort of like a, a yellow warming gel on it um, that I positioned off camera to the side to bring some light back onto the granite rocks. Night sky, this is double arch with um, you know, static star field and using a, um, uh, a flashlight, a very powerful flashlight with, once again, I put a warming gel over it um, so it doesn't look white. I want it to have a nice tone to it. Um, and I painted the, uh, the inside of these arches. These arches are huge. You could fit a two-story house inside of this little location. I mean, that's, it's a big amphitheater of rock. So a big flashlight is needed to paint that. This is the same arch as this from a different perspective. And I used uh, my PhotoPills app to make sure that I knew where the Milky Way was gonna line up. And then I used a Loom Cube, which is a small little portable device that I can put gels on. And I just put it on this little tiny tabletop tripod and sat it on the rock behind the arch. And I used that to illuminate the arch. And I did these uh, Milky Way shots out there. And uh, this is in California in a place called the Al Alabama Hills. All right, that's it. I know I went a little bit over, so I uh, apologize about that. I'll stop my share and then take any follow-up questions. Right, that... yeah, so you got a bunch here, so I'm gonna read off some of them. Yeah, go for uh, it. I'm gonna try to get the equipment ones. Uh, the drone uh, name again? Uh, the one I'm using is the DJ um, Mavic Pro Air 2. Okay, and uh, lightning trigger, uh, what model do you use? I know there's a couple on the market. Which one do you use in particular? I can't remember the name of the model, the one that I have. They pretty much all work pretty well though. 
Yeah, you- I I think so. Right. So Google <laughs> Lightning Trigger. I think there's three or four companies that make them now. I don't think the one I have is even that great. I honestly, I think it's something that I bought off of one of those um, um, Chinese websites for like super cheap. And I was like, well, I'll just give it a try. And it's, it's always worked. <laughs> so uh, let's see some, uh, what is one of your uh, favorite locations? This is like asking you which kid you like best, but <laughs> favorite locations in Western US. Favorite locations out West, um, but right off the top of my head, the Colorado Plateau. So that's Southern Utah, Northern Arizona. Love it. Death Valley National Park. Love Death Valley National Park. And I'd say Colorado Rockies. Those are my three go-to favorite spots in the Western U.S. to shoot. Okay. so And they're all close together, by the way. So you can, within a, a half a day's drive, you can be in Colorado in the Rockies, the San Juans, to like, the, the desert and then half a day later be in death valley so they're all within pretty close proximity to one another now you do use uh luminosity masking i heard you mention that in post-processing uh what software do you use so there it's a photoshop uh plug-in action and they are made by um tony kuiper so they're the tk luminosity masks panel and if you want to get information on those um, you can visit his website. It is www.goodlight.us. And it's a very inexpensive panel. It costs about 30 bucks to get the luminosity panel. So it's quite cheap as far as um, photo software is concerned. I'm and making a yes. note of uh, all of these uh, programs and equipment that you're mentioning. And I will put it into the uh, thank you email that goes out to everybody. Yeah, send me an email. I'll send you a, a list of, um, okay, you know, with some um, some links or whatever that you can you can send out to folks, so it's a little easier for them to figure it out. All right, so you got a lot of brilliant cheers, Kim. Great presentation. Uh, people are starting to say, uh, and for some of the people that came in late, we had some technical difficulties. We didn't get going until about two fifteen. Uh, once we figured that out, it went. So some of you that have missed it, Ellen's on here on the chat and she's president of the Federation. We did record this. Uh, so we'll be able to send it to you for those of you who missed it. Um, or being in early. All right. Uh, any favorite East coast shots? They, they want no East coast. Now they're all greedy. <laughs> I love shooting on the East coast. Yeah. Um, Appalachian mountains. I mean, like you cannot go wrong in the Appalachians, whether you're in Tennessee or Maine. Okay. That whole chain of the Appalachians is incredible. Favorite spots in the Appalachians. Um, Shenandoah national park is a big one for me, but you gotta be willing to hike because all the good stuff in Shenandoah requires hiking. Um, the, um, the Pisgah, P I S G A H Pisgah national forest of North Carolina. That's down towards the Smokies off the Blue Ridge Parkway. Incredible photography down there. Waterfalls, big mountain vistas for Appalachian style mountains. Um, the Allegheny Mountains of West Virginia, that's the Canaan Valley, Davis area. Great waterfalls, great canyon vistas. Dolly Sods is up there, incredible place to shoot. And then probably anywhere in New England, Acadia National Park, anywhere in Vermont during October is, in Vermont or New Hampshire, is incredible in October. Acadia National Park, any time of the year, but fall is spectacular. And then I'd say for um, coastal stuff, East Coast, uh, Charleston and Savannah, the low country. And then of course, my new favorite place is the, the cypress swamps in Texas and Louisiana. So I, I went down there this past um, November um, and explored um, the, the cypress swamps of uh, on the Texas Louisiana border and man it is one of the most incredible places I've ever shot it is haunting um like I've never seen the trees are so beautiful um in fact I'm doing two workshops down there in November and they both sold out within like I think three hours because once I put the images up from that place people are like oh my god <laughs> it's pretty incredible down there well but you gotta- so you're right we're not going to be able to get all of these questions on the locations uh Ellen's going to send up for all of you that signed up, we're going to send a follow-up email. We'll send in your equipment gear. 
let them know where where they go to your website you have your classes your workshops and everything else like that right so super easy it's uh and i'll send it to uh, ellen as well to put out but it's it's my name.com joseph um you can check out stuff that i offer uh, most of our workshops are almost full for next year but there's still some spots left on some of them so check that out but i also do a lot of um online education i do about two webinars a month on a variety of topics from digital processing to focus stacking and, and composition or whatever. Um, I teach classes with uh, Ian Plant and Kurt Bulliger online mentor classes. So you can see all that stuff. You can see my images on the website and um, I'll have a brand new website coming out probably in about 15 to 30 days. I've been working on it for the last three months um, and it's gonna look amazing. So like if you go to the website now Sign up for my mailing list, and when the new one comes out, I'll send um, a note a note out about that because I, I, I'm really proud of it. And I think it's um, going to be an incredible new website. So I'd love for people to take a look at that when it does come out. And thanks everybody for having me. I really appreciate it.